they had a say. It wasn't us coming in and saying, we have the answer, get out of the way, we're going to do this for you. It was, hey, let's come up with a solution together. We say Tamika Pomoja in Swahili, which basically means uh, let's work together on this. Welcome to The Art of Charm. I'm your host, Jordan Harbinger. Today we're talking with my friend, Justin Wren. He's an MMA athlete who fights for the forgotten. That's literally the name of his charity. He's made a family of pygmies enslaved in the Congo. I didn't even know that those were a real thing until he told me and showed me on YouTube. He's buying them land with his fight purse winnings and drilling wells in the jungle so they can have clean water. And his own story of coming back from addiction-induced retirement and finding purpose in helping others is not only inspiring, but super interesting. I'm uh, really glad to have you here with us for this episode of the show. And by the way, if you're new to The Art of Charm, we'd love to send you some top episodes and the AOC Toolbox. That's where we study the science of people and discuss things like reading body language and having charismatic nonverbal communication, the science of attraction, negotiation techniques, social engineering, networking and influence strategies, mentorship, persuasion tactics, and everything else that we teach here at The Art of Charm. Check that out at theartofcharm.com slash toolbox or in our iPhone app, at theartofcharm.com slash iPhone. Also at theartofcharm.com, you can find the full show notes for this and all previous episodes of the show. We're glad to have you with us here today at AOC. And enjoy this episode with Justin Wren. Well, thanks for coming out, by the way. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah. This is awesome. Yeah, I mean, you really do fight for the forgotten. We can talk about that in a bit. But I watched the fight this morning, which is, it's weird watching MMA in the morning. I don't know what it, it's kind of like having a beer in the morning. Yeah. You're like, I don't know, it feels too early for this somehow. It's like, I'm eating oatmeal and watching you just nail this guy with pink hair in the back of the head over and over and over. Uh, the commentator said, this is a far more aggressive Justin Wren than we've seen. Mm. So were you not as aggressive before? Because I feel like the line between not aggressive and aggressive in MMA has to be pretty fine. Yeah, so I had taken five years and two months off from the sport. So I started fighting professionally at 19 years old, did really well, and I was always that guy that you saw this last fight that you just watched. So I was always more aggressive. But then coming back after the layoff, it was a learning process because I had had five years off, the muscle memory was gone, there was ring rust, and um, I was just trying to win. What's and, ring rust? That sounds, I mean, it's probably what it sounds like, but. Yeah, explain that. Ring rust is probably where just there's the loss of muscle memory and just everything's a little slower and you're trying to work out the kinks and get back in it. You know, these competitive fighters are fighting two, three times a year, sometimes four, and then they're training five, six days a week, two to three times a day. And so that muscle memory is just firing. And then when you come back after a long layoff, even a year is a long layoff and I have five years off. So this is don't come come back yeah it sounds like you retired and then just didn't and you unretired versus taking a break in your training yeah absolutely and so coming back and then those five years off i wasn't training at all i was going back and forth to congo living there for a year and so yeah getting back into it and i rushed back i mean i had basically six weeks of a fight camp to get ready for a professional fight again on a big stage and so i just fought two boring decisions i mean not not necessarily boring but uh, I tried to outbox the boxers, and I'm a ground guy. I'm a wrestler and a jiu-jitsu guy next. And so I was striking with these guys that grew up striking, and I had to beat them at their own game. And so the aggressive part, trying to beat a guy at his own game, if I made a mistake, you're going to pay for it, especially at the heavyweight division. So uh, anyways, I got back to my roots, and it just started to flow again. So you kind of slip back from unconscious competence where you're, it's, things are firing automatic because you've trained so much versus ring rust situation where you go all right, make sure that I'm doing that. You're sort of thinking about a plan at some point instead of just going on, I don't know, animal instinct that's been beaten into you literally in the in the dojo or the training yeah, arena. I, yeah, absolutely. And uh, what was really great this last time was I was really able to focus. We have a team around us now, and so I'm able to do what I need to do in the gym. And the first two fights back, I was writing a book. The second one, we were doing a documentary. And so there was, I was spreading myself too thin and not being able to focus in the fight game like I should. And uh, that, that, that can be very dangerous for a fighter. Yeah, it seems like you can only do one job when your job is to not get hit or hit somebody else more than more slash harder than they hit you. You should probably try to specialize in one, one thing. Yeah, Set the absolutely. iPhone aside for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, Jeez. yeah absolutely. Yeah. They, the, the commentators also were saying things like, this is the fastest he started, and uh, think about the pressure involved in that. Every dollar goes towards a cause you've devoted your life to. And I, I, I kind of was hoping you weren't actually thinking about that in the moment, because 
it seems like during the fight, you might get a little bit of motivation thinking, wow, I better win because if I win, I can drill five wells or something like that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you kind of wouldn't want to be thinking, I better win because I can drill five wells when you should be thinking, not maybe not thinking about anything. Yeah, absolutely. And to be honest, uh, the first fight back, um, having a short fight camp and then having that pressure and that weight knowing this time I'm fighting for a real reason, for a cause, for a people, for, for yeah, to drill wells, to knock out the water crisis. That's what I want to do. And so I had that weight on my shoulders. And this, this last time, this third fight back, uh, man, I just felt like that weight was lifted off of me. I just need to go in there, do what I love, perform at a high level. Um, and if I can't do that, if I can't prove that to myself on the third time, that I, I'm still, I can still hang with these guys and not just that, I can outpace them, I can outwork them, um, I can put them away, I can finish. Um, instead of going to the, the scorecards, the decisions, letting the judges decide, I need to put this guy away. And so it was just great to have that feeling back, uh, you know, hey, uh, I'm back. So Yeah, it's it's got to be a lot of pressure to put on yourself. And it seems like that would be useful during training when it's like, mm -hmm. oh, I really want to mail it in for the last couple sprints because I'm tired. And it's like, okay, push yourself because of the think of the pygmies or whatever right. right but in in the fight itself it's like just that stuff probably needs to be packed away and you've got to rely on your training otherwise there's just too much going on upstairs yeah uh you, you're right about that but i also like pressure um i thrive normally under pressure the first two they just weren't uh weren't ideal circumstances for a professional fight and fighter the training uh that i was getting in so having it all being knowing I was able to go in with so much more confidence knowing that, hey, I do have the reason and the purpose and the passion, but I also have the training to back it, the skill set to back it, and I put in the time and effort and hard work. And so almost as a fighter, you need to have uh, stack up the chips and stack the deck in your favor. So that way you know going in there, like when the going gets tough and you have to dig deep because you're pushing this guy, he's pushing you, you're each trying to break each other. Yeah. Um, so I, I've got to have more things that I can pull out of my hat and or pull out of my heart my fighter's heart and say like i deserve this win i put in the work like not just the cause because that's not going to win you a fight like i put in the work too to back it up do your emotions ever get in the way and or help during a fight because it seems like you could you hear a lot of and you see in movies stupid stuff like think about the reason for this and it's like well is that just hollywood or are you really thinking about the cause at some point when you feel like if i get punched one more time i'm going down or is that just all something that gets in the way and is extraneous by that point during the fight i'm not actually thinking about it but before the fight it helps yeah it helps me get more motivated and so i even my walkout song is some of the pygmy music from the forest in the congo yeah which uh nobody else probably gets and probably wonders what what in the heck is that it sounds like this kind of yodeling and tribal music <laughs> and uh you know i know the sounds and i know who they are um so that pumps me up it gets me excited but once i'm in there i'm there to do a job i gotta win and when i get to win i get to talk about uh the cause then so before i'll do it but during the fight put that all on the shelf yeah and then after the fight get right back to it what is that instrument i saw that in one of the videos that you have in the pygmy camp where there's a guy it looks like a guitar but there's like a curved branch coming out of it with little knots and he's playing it's almost like a weird guitar slash harp yeah what's that thing so he I, if i can remember back to that specific instrument they just I mean, they're so ingenious and innovative and they can make things from nothing uh the kids are carving you know uh while we're out there with our our truck they're carving out of wood uh trucks with our symbols and and <laughs> our logo and everything on it um so they they can do so much great stuff uh this instrument was half of a bow and arrow that broke um and then they used one of our spare tires uh, or sorry not spare tires one of the tires that blew out and then they ripped uh, the rubber apart and got the metal like strings that line inside the tires so that they could make guitar strings. Wow. Out of and then I think it was a, uh, a coffee can also. <laughs> yeah, because the res there's resonance from the strings, right? Right. That's incredible because yeah. it sounds pretty good sounds for pretty something good. that is made out of an old tire and some sticks, yeah. essentially. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it was interesting to watch these guys and the whole village. And you showed these nail knives oh, yeah. where I guess they're taking a metal nail and hammer it down and it looks like a pocket knife. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's so, so impressive. Yeah, it's awesome, man. That's Chief Leo May. And I love that dude. Um, and yeah, he, he goes out there and there's a lot of illegal deforestation out there. Mm -hmm. He'll see like a ladder and he'll find some uh, nails, pull them out of the ladder after they're done logging. And then he makes some nails for the village. Do they just or figure this? Nice for the village. Do they just figure this stuff out? I wondered where they got metal in the middle of the jungle. That explains it. Right. Right. But 
how do you know, oh, I can hammer this down and make a knife out of it? Yeah, I think they just learn from what they need and uh, they, what they see. And so originally their their best arrows that they have, uh, now they use scrap metal to make some metal tipped arrows, but they'll sit there and ask you, you know, which one would you use on a bird and which one would you use on an antelope or mm -hmm. a wild hog? And they have this one that's just sharpened wood and they have one with the wicked looking, uh, uh, I don't know, scrap metal ones that they made and it looks sharp, it's bigger, heavy duty, and that's what we know here. So I'm like, oh, you use that one for the bigger one, and you use the little one for the bird. And they're like, uh-uh, because on the, uh, the one that we sharpen, we put poison on that. And so they mm. mash up these roots and these berries and these leaves that are all poisonous and make this like black tar kind of looking stuff. And that's what's at the tip of their arrow. And so over the years, they just found out the perfect mixture from the different things that's wild. That are right there. That's crazy. I, I saw when they're walking through the jungle and they have, I guess it's like a, a root net that they use to hunt. Mm, yeah. Or ma net made, made out of roots. Right. And they're carrying it on their head and then he's got that spear with that flail, flayed metal tip. Mm -hmm. And I thought, if I ran into that guy in the jungle, I would be, I mean, if I'm already in the jungle alone, there's a problem. But I would be <laughs> freaking tripping out. And I, I, it's the stuff of nightmares, except then you see them laughing and having fun, so, so it kind of cures the cures that whole thing but yeah. it, they look really scary i mean it looks just like you would imagine some travel folks who don't have a lot of other western contact and we'll right. link to, we'll embed some of these videos in the show notes oh, so cool. people can see what's going on there yeah, but absolutely. it is are you using just your iphone or a gopro or something in the jungle there to film everything yeah normally it was my iphone and then once uh once there was like a little short film made of what we were doing <laughs> uh, people called for it to be a documentary and we threw it up on kickstarter and got it funded wow and uh yeah so now we've been filming over the last three years having a documentarian named Derek Watson. He's an Emmy award-winning filmmaker. Did a documentary with Forrest Whitaker. And so it's just really cool to see what it's turned into from a couple of iPhone videos to then a GoPro to now like this professional being able to come in. And, and really he's developed a deep relationship with the people learning their story. Like oh, with my book, I, I it was my attempt to give them a voice. That was my first promise to the chief. He asked, you know, we don't have a voice, can you at least have one? So I said, yeah. And so then when the book happened, that was my attempt, but now the video or the documentary, that's gonna be them having their own voice telling their own story. Um, so I'm just so stoked about that. What's the dance that you do after the fight? That's related to the pygmy stuff. I mean, there's, I saw that and I thought, okay, if you don't know he's doing a pygmy thing, and they call you the big pygmy, actually. Right. If you don't know that he's doing a pygmy dance, you might think, what the hell is this guy doing? It's like dancing in the end zone. Right. Except it looks like a it looks like a little person dance because of how close the foot movements are. But you're the, how how big you're how tall are you? Uh, I'm six foot three. Yeah, so six three. So you're about right. twice the size of probably a pygmy. Right. I guess. The average men's height is only four foot seven. Out wow. There. Yeah. So they're they're a bunch of little dudes with great big hearts. And yeah, those little foot steps in order without of that. Oh, maybe it's because they're smaller guys. Maybe they have kind of this little. Congo line or Congo line, I guess, but uh, yeah. the, the men and the women are in their separate lines and the men are over there and that's just the dance that they do with uh, around the fire. And we'll embed the fight video from Bellator in the show notes because I thought that I thought that was interesting. And, and then uh, I think even during your victory speech, you said, I hope that doesn't look cocky. It's a pygmy dance. Yeah, absolutely. Because I was I, like, what are you doing? The first two, I didn't have anything to dance. Uh, first two comeback fights, I, I didn't have anything to dance about. You know, it was a decision. I had to wait for the judge's decision. But uh, once you finish a guy, yeah, it, was, it called for a little celebration or dance. Well, let's go back to the beginning. Why did you start fighting in the first place? Oh, I started fighting because I grew up actually getting really heavily bullied. Um, About, I take it you were not six foot three with a no. Viking appearance. No, and that was that my time. former fight name was the Viking. The Vi I can uh, see that. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. It so, does match better than Big Pygmy, but <laughs> you're you right. know, you got to roll with the current branding. Yeah, and so it was... Uh, it was something that I wanted to do since I was 13 years old. Um, it, it's something that actually kind of gave me hope when I was going through a lot of the bullying. I, um, I know a lot of people get bullied, and, um, and I really feel for them. I think it's made me even more compassionate person growing up that sure, way. Sure, I would imagine. Or yeah. it would make you a bully. As well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think you have you know, that crossroads that you come to. Well, now you've got the best of both worlds because you can help the pygmies, and you can also beat people up when you want to. You can <laughs> right. just sort of flip between those two things as therapy calls right. for. Yeah, well, I just remember <laughs> I just remember sitting at the lunch table sometimes all by myself and getting pelted in the back of the head with, like, chocolate milk spit wads and you know, name, names being thrown at me. And, uh, and we're going to 
the high school home, homecoming, thinking that, uh, or actually middle school, thinking that, uh, uh, you know, this date said yes to me, and I get there, and it was actually, uh, she was going with another guy named ah. Justin, and so she came up, a guy came up there and took her away, or uh, I think, yeah, I have this one time in eighth grade uh, where this girl named Jennifer, she asked me to come to her birthday party, and uh, I knew that she loved Transformers, and that her dad worked at Dr. Pepper, and their house was even doc decorated with Dr. Pepper stuff. Oh, wow. And so I made myself head to toe uh, into a Dr. Pepper Transformer. So romantic. Cardboard boxes, right? <laughs> Just a young, dumb kid that wanted to impress this girl that was my crush. And yeah. so uh, I, I got their duct tape. I was from a country town, like, I don't know, kids in the country. So we seem to use duct tape a lot. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, I made that, went there. Uh, went to the backyard, and whenever I got there, the whole uh, all the cool kids were there waiting, and I got met with a couple of flashes of light and um, people laughing, and uh, <sighs> and it was I was it was a big setup. It wasn't a costume party at all. It was just for me seeing if I would come. Oh no, um, that's yeah. so awful. Yeah. So one guy said, uh, uh, or actually Jennifer said, I can't believe you thought you were cool enough to come to my party. What a uh, yeah, <laughs> Jennifer. Yeah. And then one of the guys said, you know what, you're you're worthless. I felt worthless. And like I said, you should just kill yourself. That was no, the, that's terrible. Yeah. So at 13 years old, you believe the things people say about you. Right. So I felt worthless. I, um, I, I actually went into this like spiraling depression that I was even clinically diagnosed with depression from the you know doctor. And so um, that was tough for me. But when I found the UFC, at, I was 13. I was walking around this like flea market. And I, it was like some used VHS tapes and yeah I was, was gonna say you're 13 how old are you now uh 29 yeah so I'm 37 but even then UFC was maybe available on VHS somehow yeah. maybe whenever I found it it was actually illegal on pay-per-view um they had banned it because it had been advertised as a blood sport and as human cockfighting and right. as the modern day gladiators and no rules you know anything goes Right, uh, that was one shots were legal. Yeah, but they had. I remember when I first started watching it. It was also VHS. This is probably two thousand, two thousand and one, or maybe right. even two thousand and three. And they were like, "Oh yeah, no fish hooking because yeah, you just don't come back from that. It's right. quite the same. No, no eye gouging. No, no biting. eye gouging. Right. Yeah. The rules. No eye. No bite, uh, biting. No eye gouging and no fish hooking yeah, because you just rules. can't compete against the three rules. Again. Groin strikes were all right. <laughs> yeah, it's just. And I remember thinking, <clears throat> there's kind of no way to get around. Mm -hmm that because if, if you just can rail someone in the balls over and over and over it's yeah. gonna be a short fight even if you have a cup yeah there was actually a fight uh i think if they someone youtubes it just it said joe son and uh he he fought in there and he took like 20 groin shots in a row just absolutely brutal from i think keith hackney mm. and uh, that was on one of those vhs tapes that i bought and, and you're like, like, I got to do this. <laughs> well, it yeah. hurts less than being dressed up as a transformer and getting laughed at. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. I was like, I want to give someone some of those. Um, no, but I, 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 I saw it though. And, and what I actually fell in love with from the sport was how it was taking these Olympic sports, the Olympic sport of wrestling, boxing, judo, Brazilian jiu-jitsu as well. And, uh, and, and putting it into one sport. And so I looked at it and I, that was actually what I, well, First thing that drew me to it was I bet these guys don't get bullied and they can defend themselves. Yeah, I bet they don't. Yeah, I bet they don't get bullied. They can defend themselves. They're probably not the laughing stock of the party. Maybe they're actually invited. Um, and then, yeah, and then I just fell in love with the sport. It's like a human chess match. And I loved how strategic it was. Um, and I think I saw through the bad marketing that they were doing at the time. And because whenever you see some of those fighters, how disciplined they are, this guy's an Olympic gold medalist or he's an Olympian. Like he's not some knucklehead street fighter, barroom brawler, drinking a beer. Yeah. Fight. It like, seems like the original marketing back then, they were like, we need the wrestling crowd, except we want the wrestling crowd that's more adult and already knows that wrestling is scripted in some ways and, and mm -hmm. I don't want to say fake because it's real athleticism but it's not real it's entertainment, striking yeah. uh, but they need the adult version of that which is always when you're a kid and you find out wrestling is fake you're like well where's the real version right so they marketed towards that and th the initial branding was drunk rednecks are gonna love this right it wasn't <laughs> like the whole world is gonna be watching this stuff yeah yeah absolutely so, uh, but yeah, then after that, uh, got into wrestling, uh, 15 years old, uh, and I uh, mean, I was just really fortunate. My two high school coaches were both Olympic gold medalists. Um, they were NCAA champs for Oklahoma State Wrestling, which is just like uh, the, the best wrestling club ever. Um, and so, yeah, it was Kenny Monday, Kendall Cross, learning from the best right from the start. Uh, and they just started, um, you know, I was, I was young, I was uh, 
I would say almost fragile with going through the depression, going through the bullying. I had to transition out of the school I was at. My parents sent me from the, the public school to a private school um, to get me away from that. And then, yeah, uh, these guys just invested in me. They saw a desire to, to want to learn. And they say, we can, we can work with that. While you were still in high school, they were doing this? Yeah, absolutely. How did they find you? Through the wrestling team? The wrestling program? Yeah. Uh, Kenny Money and Kittle Cross were the high school coaches at the school. Gotcha. And so, it's just very fortunate. There wasn't one other Olympic gold medalist at any high school uh, coaching. And yeah, what had, are the odds? Yeah, and we had two at the same school. Jeez. And so, uh, it was just a powerhouse. It was a Texas wrestling school, which isn't known for Texas. Uh, Texas isn't known for wrestling. And so, uh, but theirs came to, or ours, Bishop Lynch High School. Um, we were the best in the state, but then we were the second best in the country. Um, and yeah, because we had great coaches and uh, a lot of us were coachable and we'd listen. Go figure. Yeah. yeah. And then you ended up on Ultimate Fighter, the reality show, yeah? Yeah. So uh, out of high school, I went to the Olympic Training Center and then from there uh, started battling drug addiction because I had this elbow surgery right here. Oh yeah, so that's this, a nice little scar you got. How did that happen? Uh, I was wrestling uh, an Olympic bronze medalist world champion and I was 18. He was like 30 something. Um, oh, that's safe. What could go wrong? <laughs> right. Yeah. And he was just, uh, he was just great. But I was a two time national champion in wrestling. And so, uh, uh, I went out there, wanted to compete, wanted to test myself, and just in a freak accident, uh, snapped my arm. And uh, it was just weird. It was a one-point move. It wasn't anything crazy. It was just the way that I fell. Yeah. And uh, broke oh, it, man. dislocated it, tore the ulnar collateral ligament. And then, living at the Olympic Training Center, I wanted to be able to compete again. And the doctors were telling me I only had a 30 35% chance of competing again. So What's going through your mind at that point? Like, crap, the only thing I like is yeah. now... Yeah, this is, right. the, this is the one thing that has given me a sense of purpose and identity. Like, that was where I felt, I mean, growing up from a completely, uh, I don't know, feeling worthless, bullied, to then going to wrestling, having success, finding friends on the wrestling team, and then becoming successful at it, the best in the country. Um, and then, yeah, wanting to pursue the Olympics, living at the Olympic Training Center. Then all of a sudden they say, you might not ever be able to do this again. You only have a 30 to 35% chance of ever competing again. Um, man, that, that rocked me because, uh, it sent me right back into that depression. I yeah. think wrestling helped pull me out of it. Um, and then once, once the only thing I liked and was the only thing I was good at was maybe ripped away from me. Uh, yeah, I spot right back into that depression and I got hooked on uh, narcotics really bad. The painkillers yeah. from the surgery. Yeah. So they wanted me to go to a, uh, mainly an ankle doctor who did knee surgeries. Um, for my elbow. We're talking about your elbow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And he had to petition with our insurance company and, uh, even write letters and we had to go to an appeal process, uh, so that I could get an actual elbow doctor to do my elbow. Surgery. I was going to say, where's the elbow doctor yeah. and all this? Yeah, exactly. So luckily going through that process, I got the best guy in the country, one of them at least. And, uh, but at that time I had to wait four months. So during that four months, all they could give me was like, yeah, oxy. pills. Yeah. Oh. pills to, uh, my ulnar collateral ligament was completely, uh, Severed. What is that? Is that so, the one that goes? It's the inside. So the it's inside. basically the surgery I had was the Tommy John surgery that a lot of the professional baseball pitchers get. Um, and they took a uh, tendon out of my hamstring. There's three like hamstring tendons. They took one of those out, the center one, and they replaced my ligament and my elbow with it. So are you so, one tendon short on that side then? I am, yeah. That doesn't sound safe either though. Yeah, no, actually they said it's the, it's the one that the other two will will strengthen up and basically the doctor was telling me he, he's, he's a good salesman i guess because uh it was it was great because he was like we could give you a cadaver um but you know you're a big strong guy who wants to compete we don't know how we're going to find that so a <laughs> tendon is stronger than a ligament so we'll put that uh, a leg tendon into your arm so it'll be like you're kicking people in the face when you punch them so. oh yeah so you got upgraded <laughs> yeah i got okay. upgraded yeah Nice, good. Well, at least there's a, an upside to that. Okay, so how did that trend then translate to you getting on the show? I think I, I right. jumped over that with the elbow injury. Oh, no, yeah. So I started fighting uh, at 19 years old professionally. Once I was able to, to see I'm going to be able to compete again, um, I wanted to get paid to do this professionally because uh, mm -hmm. wrestling there wasn't really an opportunity um, except for MMA was, was growing, really growing. And so that's where a lot of the wrestlers go. So, yeah, I took my first pro fight. Um, at 19 years old, I was actually coaching, and uh, I was, wasn't was even supposed to be in there. And uh, my guy got hurt and couldn't compete. And so the day before, they threw me in there, ended up winning in about a minute and a half. The next fight... That sounds horrifically kind of ad-libbed or hodgepodge. or yeah. Talk about winging it. Like, 
hey, your guy's injured. I don't know. The fight's tomorrow. Do you want to do it? Right. This was in Podunk, Oklahoma, <laughs> and it was, they don't they, – now they have a boxing commission there, state athletic commission, but they didn't at that time. It was yeah. unregulated. <laughs> um, second fight was kind of similar. The third fight was in Iowa at the – I don't know, the Ames or – uh, Ames, Iowa, where Iowa State University is. It was their uh, county fairgrounds. <laughs> and, Seems legit. Yeah, and I was uh, three beers in, um, and I was in the stands just watching. I had a button-down shirt and jeans on and dress shoes, and a guy gets in there and says, my opponent didn't show up. He weighed in yesterday, but he didn't come today. If there's anyone that's heavyweight, <laughs> wants to fight today, uh, you know, raise your hand. And so I, We're I looking know. for a big guy who's still not <laughs> too drunk that they can't walk and can fit into this pair of shorts. Right. Who absolutely. qualifies? This was back in the old school days. Not as old school where there weren't rules, but this was when it was still developing and taking off. Now it's more mainstream. It's regulated and everything else. But yeah, so it started getting <laughs> much better, and I got on the Ultimate Fighter TV show, which uh, was my ultimate goal was to be in the UFC. Um, and so not the ultimate goal, but one of the big goals in fighting you want to get there. So you beat the guy who challenged you while you were in the stands? Yeah. Just thinking... That was my quickest fight ever, actually. You got, like, corn dogs in your belly, and you're like, <laughs> I can do it. Right. What's, what, how hard can it be? I actually had to go backstage, borrow another fighter's shorts for the fight yeah. there. I had to get an unboiled, uh, unfitted mouth, mouth guard, guard yeah. uh, from back there. And then uh, you have one of the rules is you do have to wear a cup, and so that's I, probably a good idea. Yeah, so you took this sweaty cup, cup from I, the other guy. Yeah, that's one of my. Uh, I won't ever do that again. Yeah, your wife um, loves this story. Isn't she? <laughs> she, like, take a shower before you get back in the car. Right? <laughs> so yeah, but it, it was uh, maybe it was motivation to get in and out because it was only about sixteen seconds, uh, the fight, and um, no. So, but after that, I decided, man, I I think I can be good at this. I need to dedicate myself. Yeah. Um, and yeah, from there, I just started setting my. My, my goals and what I wanted to do accomplish in the sport and as a person and um, and yeah I started trying to rally around that how did you kick the oxy habit after taking it for months and months um I didn't uh, it was a six year battle so wow it was a six year addiction and it started before my fight career did um, and so that was one of the main reasons for my five year layoff from fighting was I needed to I got kicked off my fight team I was uh, I think I was 12 and two or 13 and two. Um, and I was fresh off the ultimate fighter. I was the youngest heavyweight in the UFC. Um, everyone else was normally in their thirties, uh, mid thirties. And I got on there 21, 22. You're like, uh, um, what's is that guy now? Kevin, um, He's the youngest. He's like I'm the youngest ultimate fighter. He's 25. Oh, Kevin, Kevin Gastelum. Yeah, I always yeah. forget his his last name. He right. he lives here in San Jose. Yeah, as well as from here, I should say. Right. Yeah. yeah so I w I was kind of like kind of like a, a little bit of a Kelvin, and so um, I yeah had had that opportunity, and even on the Ultimate Fighter, I was sneaking in pills, uh, and yeah, I just um, I was battling that addiction the whole time. Whenever I finally came through it. I was like, okay, I need to, to really set a firm foundation of like sobriety. And, uh, and this life has always been about me. Uh, it's always been about what I want and, uh, and which is, which can be good if it's a, a positive outlet, but whenever it was just all about me and my significance and identity and self-worth came from my success as a fighter or as a wrestler, then it's a roller coaster ride. Of like if you win things are good if you lose things are terrible and awful right um and then yeah even if you win though and you're battling an addiction like now you have an excuse either way to use you know you want to celebrate party have fun um and then if you lose you just want to numb yourself and forget that it ever happened so you're fighting against the addiction you're fighting against the ghosts of these bullies from your past essentially you're fighting against yourself your own mind at this point and then you kick the addiction. Did you kick it cold turkey by just going to Congo? I mean, I'm trying to put the timeline together in my head. Yeah. So for me, um, man, I had tried different stuff and um, tried a little quietly, you know, tried to keep it under wraps. And um, It's hard to do that with addictions that make you look sloppy or make yeah. your speech slower or make you pass out in your own. Absolutely. My, my teammates, I, I would be there for my fights, uh, training, but then after they helped me get ready for a fight, uh, they have a fight coming up. I would just disappear. I would go off on a six week, eight week long binge. No oh, man. One of those times, uh, my best friend left me a voicemail, and on the other line he said, "I can't believe you missed my wedding. I can't believe my best oh, man. Oh man. Yeah. I can't believe my best man didn't show up." And so I was just a hurt dude that was hurting people. I was jacked up, 
and uh, I, I basically broke every relationship that I ever had. Um, a lot of them to where it was almost beyond repair, but it's, I've been fortunate, you know, now, uh, now things have really changed around. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's, it's, it's been a learning process for sure. And I'm still not, I'm still a work in progress. That's, that's for sure. But, um, but yeah, it's been six years and 10 months and 15 days, uh, that, that the life has just kind of completely changed around. Did he ever forgive you for missing his wedding? Yeah, absolutely. He's, we were great. actually texting, uh, I think, maybe two days ago. Okay, that's yeah, because you hate to see something like that. Yeah. Especially because weddings are important. I'm having one really soon as yeah. well. But I think if my, if my best man was hooked on a substance, I would be more worried about him than mm -hmm. pissed off. I mean, I'd be pissed, don't get me wrong. Right. But I'd be much more worried because your wedding is one day, but an addiction is... Hopefully not for the rest of your life, right? Yeah, and he was a great guy, supportive the whole time. Um, but yeah, you know, at that time in my life, all I saw was the dark cloud that I was that I left over that special day of his. And so, right after I heard that voicemail, I turned right back to the drugs. Of so, course, yeah, right. It yeah. had the opposite effect, probably that it intended. Right, absolutely. Yeah. So, oh man, so you're you're headlining in Vegas at 23. You're fighting against people uh, who are. I mean, this is big time stuff. It's not just like the local. Was the county fair challenging the yeah, guys? Yeah, this was make the it. main event at the Hard Rock Casino in Vegas, where you know uh, the Ultimate Fighter getting six point eight million uh, viewers on average during that season. It was the biggest season of the Ultimate Fighter ever, um, and yeah, being able to fight guys that were the IFL champions or uh, Roy Big Country Nelson, who now has the um, won the Ultimate Fighter. That was a very controversial decision. Um, and then, yeah, he's got the knockout of the night uh, record in the UFC right now. So I was fighting some big name guys. Yeah, it's good to lose to somebody who goes on and kill, it just crushes it. Yeah. It sucks when you lose to somebody and they're like, "Whatever happened to that guy that beat you?" And you're like, "Yeah, he never, never made it anywhere." Yeah, then absolutely. you just look like you're one rung below that schmuck, right? Right. You might as well lose to the, a really good fighter who's mm -hmm. killing other people too. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me about the pygmy connection. How did you go from, all right, I'm going to fight, I'm going to be a pro athlete, to the jungles of the Congo. Yeah, so that was a crazy process, but I just wanted to to get started um, doing something, something with my life worthwhile. Um, and so I started locally. I mean, uh, and and a lot of times I get criticism. Why do you go over there? Why don't you help here? It's like, man, well, if you if you have ever been there and seen the suffering that they have, it's it's on another level. Um, but I believe in helping here, there, and everywhere. And so that's what I started doing. Uh, at the local, um, you know, juvenile detention center. Then I went through all the classes to become an official volunteer at the children's hospital. And then, so I just tried to look for places I could get involved. The homeless shelter, you know, serving meals and going there and hanging out with guys and seeing what I could do, what I would feel uh, kind of called to that I could dedicate my life to. And so that was fun. It was great um, getting involved here. And I was trying to do something where I don't know, just not to put a system on it, but hey, I can do something every week. What what can I do and what can I start with? And I was like, I can do something every week locally. Maybe uh, I can do something once a month nationally, like look for something to get involved in. And then once a year, maybe I can go, uh, maybe I can go internationally and make a difference. And so that's how it kind of all started and developed. Um, and then, man, this it goes back to what really helped me with my sobriety and just changed my life. But just kind of my faith, personal life. Um, it, uh, yeah. So it's a wild story, but I sat down and I said a prayer. God, will you want me to do with my life? This isn't to push anything on anybody, but uh, I always be have believed in visualization. Um, just seeing the match in your mind before you ever go wrestle. See the fight in your mind before you ever go fight. Uh, the first two fights back, uh, comeback fights, I wasn't doing that, and I suffered because of it. This third fight that you watched. Uh, I visualized that fight happening basically exactly the way it did. Um, and so, but this happened effortlessly. I just said, what do I do with my life? And I had this vision that just lit me up. And I basically had a movie in my mind. And uh, I saw myself in the forest. I was walking down a footpath. Uh, I didn't know where I was, but I get close and I hear this drumming. And then I hear the, meet these people and I hear the singing. And... I, I get my heart just crushed once I met him where it was like, man, they... Wait, what were you... This is in your mind still. This is in my mind, Okay, because yeah, I'm sorry. thinking, what the hell are you doing in the jungle? <laughs> yeah. Back no, up. 
Yeah, I know. I, I should back up and just reiterate. Like, I thought that I was tripping out or had some sort of mental break. It does rash. sound a little bit like yeah, LSD at absolutely. work. Absolutely. And, man, dude, I, I've, I've experimented with, with plenty of psychedelics. <laughs> and uh, it was similar to that. But this was more real and more vivid and uh, and more – it was just natural or kind of effortless where, man, I uh, – yeah, I saw these people that had their ribs poking out. I knew that they were hungry. I knew that they were thirsty. They didn't have clean water. That they were poor and sick. And and I knew that they were slaves. Like, that they had been enslaved by people. And I didn't know what was going on. But, like, the thing that struck me was that they felt forgotten. And, dude, I, I cried a puddle of tears this big. And I've never done that before. But I was, like, hyperventilating, crying when I came out of the vision. Felt nuts for three days. Didn't know what to do with it, right. but I wrote it down. Yeah, you're like, I don't know who I should tell about this because I'm just starting to get yeah. my shit together. Yeah, well, it's even weird to talk about now, to be honest. Like, um, but but because of what's happened since, it's given me a little more more confidence to share it. But, yeah, I mean, there's yeah. there's crazy stuff that happens, you know. And and this was the craziest thing because I could have never dreamed this. I could have never thought up. I didn't know who the pygmies were. Right. And so, um, or where the Congo was. And so, uh. Yeah, three days later, I told a friend of mine, uh, uh, actually, I just met him. His name was Caleb, or is Caleb, and he, I knew he was friends with, like, Bear Grylls and Man vs. Wild. Oh, Survival, yeah, all those crazy guys. Yeah, right. yeah. So I'm like, if there's a guy I could tell, I mean, uh, maybe it's him, and he won't think I'm too crazy, and if he does, oh, well. Um, and then I won't tell anyone again. Right, yeah, lesson yeah. learned. Right, lesson learned. And so he, um, man, he said, uh, those are the pygmies. And I said, what? Who? He goes, they're yeah. in the Congo. And I'm like, what? Where? I didn't know they were still a real group of people. Right. I thought it was something from like an old movie or a fairy tale. Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, they were supposed to be the in the original book. Uh, what is it? I think it's Willy Wonka or Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Yeah. Uh, the original text, the book, um, instead of Oompa Loompas, it was the Pygmies. Um, oh. and, and he was kind of, Willy Wonka was kind of a dark guy uh, that was, or dark character where wasn't very kind and nice. And, um, and yeah, the Pygmies were his slaves. And so, um, anyways, yeah, so I, I didn't know who they were. Uh, that was a random thing I brought up, but, uh, yeah, yeah really random. <laughs> but yeah, so he, I don't know, he told me that and he goes, man, I went last year, I met him. Those are the people that you say forgotten, that's them. How did he meet them? He was just doing a... He went on like a scouting trip. So this guy goes all over the world and does good, good and humanitarian effort and missions work. And so he just, he's like, man, you want to go meet him? Come with me. And, uh, then I found out he was taking a team of three other guys. Uh, who all backed out because the rebels had take over, taken over the airport. Um, and it was just, uh, it's chaos in Congo. Um, it's not a, they did a failed state study and they said that Congo is the only country that should be considered a non-state, that it's just the wild, wild west. And this was, I think, backed by Oxford. It was a uh, South African university that did the study. And there's 38 different warring rebel groups in the west, uh, east. Congo. Well, you yeah, got like we're going. minerals, uh, elements like coltan, yeah, you got diamonds, gold. Yeah. coal, uh, I think coal. Yeah, coal uh, and gold. Gold, yeah. I think I might have said, yeah, diamonds and gold. And then you've got just lumber, which is yeah. also valuable, yeah, which yeah, is really hard to... hardwoods, like mahogany and uh, uh, the, what is it, ebony, and uh, just different stuff out there that is, is really dense, heavy hardwoods that are really rare and expensive. And so... Yeah, the deforestation there is crazy. I think they said in the last 20, 25 years, um, since they started getting all the mechanical chainsaws and everything out there, that the size of Texas has been deforested oh, in the Congo. So, just brutal. I mean, uh, the, the town that our team, our well drillers, are based in, that used to be the rainforest. Now it takes six hours to get to the rainforest. That's so so tragic yeah. and sad. But that that whole country is kind of one long, sad Story, yeah. story with no yeah. happy ending yeah. so far. Yeah, absolutely. Ever since uh, even King Leopold II, there's a great book called uh, King Leopold's Ghost, and it talks about that that was the African Holocaust, where Congo at the time had about 20 million uh, in population, and any, at least eight, but up to 10 million people were killed during the time that the Belgians came and colonized, uh. and that was because of the rubber boom and ivory. And so they came there and just, yeah, completely destroyed the country. And since then, it's just been a constant. It's the most rich country on the planet. They should be the most developed, probably, because of all their riches. Right. And they're the most underdeveloped. That's kind of the whole story of yeah. much of Africa, though, is right. look at all these natural resources and ancient technology, and now they have, they're still, they, they still have nothing. Yeah. I mean, they don't even have water. Unless, yeah, unless you've, unless you've the one, villages where you've been, they don't have water. Right, so I think it's around 1% of people have access to clean water. There's 74 million people in Congo. 
Um, That's a huge. Think about how huge that is because it looks on the when you look at Africa on a map, it just looks like this hodgepodge of random places that you can't are indistinguishable. Right. And to have seventy four million people there, what is that? Like almost a third of the United States. Right. It's it's huge, man. Um, and even if you look up uh, just Google the real size of Africa, you'll see how huge Africa is. You can fit the whole United States in there, plus India, plus China, um, and Japan, and like I think it's. Eastern or Western Europe, you can fit that all in the continent of Africa. It's massive. It's huge. And it's just small on maps because we don't really need to look at the detail. Right. Right. And so it's wow. crazy how, how big it actually is. And Congo is massive, and it should be so rich. Um, but, yeah, it's just uh, it's brutal to see people living in those circumstances. The first time I went, that's it just it rocked me um, because I wasn't prepared for it. I never planned to go to Africa for any reason. Right, you just showed up because somebody, um, a couple guys bailed on the trip, and he's like, yeah. hey, do you want to go? And right. I said, yeah, sure. Why? Not? What could? How hard can it be to travel in the Congo? Yeah. And, man, we went, and all of a sudden we're walking down a footpath, and we get close, and we hear drumming, and we hear singing. I get in there, and I meet these people, and there's these sick people that their ribs are poking out, they're hungry, they're, they have tuberculosis, and meet the chief, and, and just, like, something hit me to where the first day I met him, I was crying, I had to walk away so that they didn't like, yeah. look at this crazy Freaking thing. out. The Vikings crying. <laughs> What's happening right now? Right. And they actually even, uh, in that village, they they actually kind of ran and hid um, because they had never seen anyone with white skin before or light skin there. And, well, uh, yeah, who hasn't tried so, to shoot them or something and right. take something from them maybe. Yeah. yeah. And, and this was just, it was really, really remote where he would go so he could see the, Caleb's goal was to see, do a scout trip to see the actual worst. And then that way we can work from there up. And so kind of, backwards but um but no i i got there and man it was uh it was there's even a viral video that was on like jimmy kimmel the today show and all this of some of the kids uh from a nearby town seeing me for the first time them all rubbing my beard and my hair and my arms because i have crazy hair hair. hair. Yeah. yeah and they don't have that there and so uh yeah but they ran hid behind trees whenever i came in there i think uh, me being a big guy bearded i got the hair that might look like a lion's mane or maybe i look like a vanilla gorilla uh, <laughs> But walking through the forest. And Vanilla Gorilla is not a bad fight name. Okay. You ever need a fallback. Okay, there we go. <laughs> um, Vanilla Gorilla. Yeah, and then, man, it just uh, it wrecked me in a way hearing that they don't have a voice, hearing that they are the first citizens of Congo and that they have no land of their own. They've never owned land legally. It's all been taken from them. Um, and then developing relationships where it wasn't like a show up, blow up, and blow out of there or here we're going to give you a bunch of handouts. Like, hey, we're actually here to listen um, and learn and actually live with you for a little bit. Um, and then the next trip was like, I need to go live with them more to understand. Like, it's one thing to, to, to read about it. It's another thing to see it. Um, and it'll last with you when you see it, but, um, it can go in and out of one ear when you read it, but whenever you live it, whenever you develop the relationships, um, whenever you suffer from some of the sickness or some of the hunger or, or you know, not having clean water, having to boil your water, having to, to use filters that then break that are supposed to last for thousands of gallons, but they only last for a few days out there. And so, uh, and then the second trip, man, living with them, uh, it was like my third to last day. It was a one and a half year old named Andy Bo uh, that actually passed away. And um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I was holding him and uh, buried him. And um, it, it just absolutely tore me open and rip my heart apart and uh, like it would I think anyone um, but not knowing that kiddos are dying of dirty water every day um, that 800 a day died just because of diarrhea from the dirty water and then another 2,350 children every day are dying just because of malnutrition from the dirty water so they're they're able they to can't absorb the, the they nutrients. can't absorb the nutrients and Jeez. so it just it wrecked me man and I came back and I'm like you know what if it was something that I wanted to do but in a way that was different than the model that I'd seen over there at that time, at least I saw a lot of handouts, but it was like, is there a way to give them a hand up? Isn't there a way to empower them to where if, if we have all the equipment to, to drill wells and if I can, um, you know, if I can go to my kitchen sink and my shower and my toilet has clean water, I can get my dog clean water. And my can, my grass has clean water. Um, can't I, uh, or can't someone give them the tools to where they can do it themselves? Like, that's what they need is the tools in their hands, a job that they can have, be proud of, go out there and do it for themselves to where they don't have to sit back and wait for the West to come in or the government to come in or an NGO or a church or anything. Like, they can do it for themselves. 
it's a whole difference, you know, either give a man a fish or teach him how to fish. Right, right. You, know, you, you can feed him for a day or feed him for a lifetime. And then uh, if you empower people truly with that, that was something that I, I realized, like, man, charity can be great, um, but opportunity is always better. Um, and I saw charity hurting people, crippling them. Uh, a lot of the communities that got these handouts, um, they didn't want it. They didn't even want it. Like, they would take it because it was available right there. And the ones that, that learned to take it and learned it just over and over, like, it's almost like they would develop a dependence mentality of, hey, when these people come, we are dependent on them. Uh, their markets are crashed from our foreign right, aid. Right, because we just completely subsidize all the stuff. So they can't yeah. grow their own stuff because we're giving away yeah. free corn or rice. Absolutely. Or they can't compete. How can they compete with American-grown rice or, or from China or India that is free or even if on a, a talking about just the market, it's cheaper than what they can produce themselves. And so it puts all these farmers out of business, depletes the, the crops that are out there. I mean, they just, they, it's, it's so jacked up the way that, that aid has been done and charity has been done. And there's a better way. And there's a more sustainable way. Even some of the, the, you know, the social entrepreneurship is really big right now. And I love it. I love the heart behind it. And even charity, the heart is good. The intent is good. Yeah, I don't think they're like, let's crash these motherfuckers' markets right. right now. Let's give them a bunch of free stuff and ruin their lives. Right. It's like Oprah, you get a car, you get a car. And they sh they say like, we couldn't afford the taxes on the car. And it's like, oh, that was totally not the idea behind giving away cars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so it's just where, it's like, how do we do it? And even social entrepreneurship to where the whole buy one, give one, um, that's that that can be really good if it's, when you give one, you're actually giving one by creating jobs in their country to where then they get to make it themselves and sell it themselves. And then they get to put money in their pockets or put their kids into school or buy some food or, or invest in themselves. Um, but if you just buy one here and then you go over there and you just give it away, now you're hurting the guy. If you do that with shoes, you know, you're hurting the cobbler, the shoe salesman. But yeah, so it's just how do you do it in a way that is more appropriate for the people there, their country, their context, their culture, um, to where it makes a long lasting impact instead of a, I heard this thing where someone was saying that, that the short term disasters around the world, oftentimes because of the foreign aid turns, it turns into a worse long term disaster. Sure. I can see that because of the things we just mentioned, markets yeah. crashing and getting rid of the, the, if the farmers go out of business instead of being temporarily bolstered by the aid, then mm -hmm. as soon as the aid dries up, they're like, Oh crap. Now we can't even grow mm -hmm. food. We don't even have people doing this. Yeah. How did you end up there for a year? You went once and then you just went, I'm going to pack a backpack and live in a hut. I mean, how did, yeah. where's the, I, where's I, the story I, there? I went, I went there twice, um, beforehand for about a month and stayed and lived with them. And that's the second time was when Andy Bo happened. And, uh, I was just like, you know what? I came back and I was in, uh, my parents had some land, like two or three acres and, I was at Home Depot and I was on a website uh, that don't go try to drill a well this way, but it's uh, how to drill your own well dot <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll link to that just so you know what not to do. <laughs> yeah. And so I was getting parts from Home Depot and trying to see if I could just go drill it myself and go over there and teach them how to do it. Um, because the, the thing that the place we were going to, you're not going to be able to drill. First off, I wasn't, I didn't think I was going to be able to fundraise for a half a million dollar or a million dollar drilling rig. And then the roads that you go on, I mean, it's dangerous. There's rebel groups, the bridges collapse, and then the villages are in the trees, I mean, in the forest. And so how do you drive a truck out there? You don't, you gotta right? be, Yeah, you don't. Yeah. It's just not possible. And so where the most need was, it wasn't possible to do it in the standard way. So we got to be able to have these tools that we can hike into the forest. And so luckily I came across an organization called Water 4 uh, that we partnered with. Uh, my Our nonprofit initiative, Fight for the Forgotten, uh, we told them what we wanted to do, that our vision was to empower the locals, that I already had, over those two trips, found some great guys. We had four guys that were just outstanding. They're just w sitting there waiting for the opportunity. They're all college-educated um, with community development degrees, um, but some of them were working at the market selling meat, and another guy was selling SIM cards. These are guys that were just had great hearts, that loved the people we wanted to serve, um, but they needed an opportunity to have a job to do it. And so it was just really cool how Waterford trained me up to go over there to train them up. And then, yeah, it's been really awesome to see it take off where in that year that I was there, I mean, I helped drill the first 13 water wells. Um, but now the next year when I came back, you know, people, people think like when you leave, a lot of the charity mindset is if I leave, it's going to all fall apart. 
Yeah. Well, well, it will if it's dependent on you. Right. If you, you could, because you got to teach them how to fish. Right. Exactly. Right. And so the next year, I was actually, I did have some fears and insecurities or just, are, are we sure that they're going to be able to uh, to do it? Not not really, because they're so rock solid, but uh, but still, you want to be part of it, and you want to be a big part of it. And so I went from almost a leader to, I guess I could say cheerleader, you know? Like, I went from, from showing them how to do it to then being in the background and cheering them on, saying, you can do this. Um, and yeah, they were able to crank out 20 water wells the next year. This last year, they did 29. And so we're up to 62, um, which has just been incredible. 3,000 acres of land for the Mabuti Pygmies. They have land of their own. Are you buying the land f with them, for yeah. them, from the state or from yeah. these other tribes or something? Right, absolutely from both. Uh, from either like land that doesn't have titles on it that, that we could relocate them to or from the locals there that benefits them for selling the land. And so it actually helps both sides of the community to where we buy land back that is legally in the name of the Pygmies so that they have land for the first time. Um, and yeah, they get to go live on it. They get to have clean water both sides. Um, and then we get to come in with a farming initiative to where they're able to learn to, to grow their own food for the first, for the pygmies for the first time. And now uh, in Babofi, they're able to go to the market. And they weren't able to make it there the first couple of times, but they have their own banana trees and their own cornfields. And they had surplus so that they, they couldn't eat it all and didn't have a place to store it really. So they go to the market and on the roadside, people are all buying it from them on their way there. And uh, so it's really cool to see what they've been able to do from that, make money and invest in themselves, you know, be able to buy clothes for their kids and be able to send them to school. It's the first time the pygmies in that area or maybe ever in Congo have been in school, paying their own school fees wow. and everything else. So it's just been kind of transformative what water can do. Water changes everything. So you're drilling these wells. How deep is the water? How, how deep do you have to drill? Uh, it, it's different, but in the rainforest, it's not as deep as some of the parts of the world, but 60 to 90 feet deep is our sweet spot. Okay, that's, that's much more shallow because it, it looks like in some of the videos, it's a glorified coffee can can picking up this light colored clay mm. out of a hole that's I don't know maybe a little bit thinner than a telephone pole yeah and they're just going in and up and in and up uh, and in and up and it must just get take 10, 10 to 12 inches at a time it must uh, just take how long does it take weeks in, in some of the countries that water for is in they can do three five seven days um, and drill a new well us in the Congo because of uh, the circumstances yeah. and um, and it being in the rainforest and getting out there and going really deep and hiking everything in sometimes we're just to get from the truck out to the forest, it can be an hour hike, two hour hike, three hour hike to unload our equipment. So to take it in and come back and pick it back up. And so that's a, can be a six hour round trip to the truck. Oh man. Um, so it takes 10 to 16 days in the Congo. To yeah. Drill. Yeah. Well, it's obviously well worth it. So you're drilling these, these water wells in each village and how many people live in a village and how close are these villages to one another? Man, it all, it all really varies. Um, but the average Mabuti Pygmy village is anywhere from 85 to 150 people, but all of ours are more around 300 um, because there's just more opportunity there. More opportunity to help more people with a single well. Right. right, and they have land ownership for the first time. And so a lot of them, you know, some of the chiefs are saying, you know, my grandchildren are going to be able to say, this was my grandfather's mm -hmm. land to their, you know, children and grandchildren. And so it's it's a... The pygmies have been semi-nomadic. You know, they, they, they are hunter-gatherers, so they travel around. Um, but whenever they had the opportunity to get land for the first time, they just settled. And uh, it's been great to see. But water's not the only problem. I mean, they're enslaved by another tribe yeah. or other tribes in general. Yeah, so not just one tribe, but it, we, we just say the Makapala, which means the non-pygmies in the pygmy language. Oh, I thought, um, these these bastards. Yeah. This tribe is all enslaved, but that just yeah. means like outsider. Yeah. Okay, um, gotcha. Basically, because we don't want to villainize one one tribe. There's over 200 tribes in the Congo, and there's several that are doing it. But then some of those tribes are outside of the Congo where the pygmies don't even live. And so if we say these are the people doing it, you know, the people in Uganda or Kenya or some guy in New York's like, bro, yeah. I've never had a slave, I yeah. swear. Never even met a right. pygmy. They're not even in our country. Exactly. Um, so we just go with what the pygmies say, which is not pygmies. And yeah, so that, that was a process. And um, and we've been able to help 10 villages in that way. So we've drilled 62 wells, but only 10 of them. Uh, we've been able to see like a peaceful, uh, pretty awesome transition. It's even being sponsored now uh, by the local governor of that state. Um, that's like, man, we need the pygmies to have their own land for the first time. So we're coming in on the local, state, and national level and sponsoring this. Um, and so we have all the legal documents. 
uh, where we come in and, and yeah, buy back the land for the pygmies, but it's in their name. They get to pass it down from generation to generation. And so we've seen about uh, over 1,500 people transition out of a life of slavery and into a life of freedom, but then they're able to go back and still work uh, for them, but now it's for pay instead of just for scraps. Speaking of pay, you're throwing your fight purse, if they still call it that, to yeah. to what, land and wells? Uh, land, water, and food initiatives in the Congo. So when you fi- talk about finding purpose, yeah. that's a big task. Yeah. So instead of spending it on oxy, you're spending it on a well. Yeah. Yeah, much, much better. Uh, More rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Much better outlet. And uh, yeah, so it's basically a fighter gets a show amount and a win amount. And so the show amount we live off of and the win amount we give. So it's about 50 50. Um, and I just love that. And the sponsors that I have, uh, we, we've transitioned everything to where it's like, hey, you want to sponsor me? Let's sponsor mm-hmm. Wells. And so, and which is better, better for them, right? Because they can maybe write some of that off and then yeah, maybe give a little bit more instead of. Mm-hmm. Pay for some shorts. Yeah, and so, man, uh, I, I'm learning on the business side of things. And that's what we do in the Congo: start up social enterprise, where you know they get to have their own business and they're their own boss and to have employees, and um, it can run, uh, you know, by itself. Uh, it doesn't need us. If something happens to me in the ring, right? Um, they're going to be able to keep doing this work. And so, uh, but yeah, it's it's something that um, yeah is just truly rewarding. I was amazed when I heard there were 27 million slaves in the world. Yeah. That was shocking because yeah. I thought, first of all, when you said, oh, you know, these in the video that I watched, oh, these people are enslaved, I thought, wow, that must be like the only slavery left anywhere right. in the middle of the jungle. But then you said, there's 27 million slaves, and I thought, where the hell are these people? Yeah. What's going on? How so, is that even possible? Yeah, so all around the world, that, that takes um, from, that, that stat takes from, you know, even sex trafficking, but India and China and all over the place where they're, you know, working in the, uh, you know, the mines and, I'm uh, forgetting what that's called, but the quarries. Quarries, uh, yeah. yeah. Quarries, and uh, yeah, but I've seen that with my own eyes in Congo and the gold mines, the diamond mines, the coltan, which is in yeah. the smartphones and everything else. But yeah, isn't that nuts that there's more slaves today than ever in human history on Earth? Which is uh, shocking, yeah. Because you think, gee, when there were slaves in Europe or slaves in the United States, imagine how many slaves there were in America when we had slavery. It was a huge right. country. Now there are actually more, even though it's been abolished everywhere that you can think of. Anywhere with cell phones, pretty much, right? <laughs> anywhere with electricity, you're thinking, oh, they don't have slaves there. Right. That's not true. Yeah. Africa's loaded, and yeah. and Asia. Africa's loaded. Asia's loaded. India's loaded. Um, and even the countries that condemn it. Uh, it's still going on silently, and they just make sure that they don't highlight that it's going on in the right. country. So. Does that count just really crappy business arrangements? Like, I know there's a lot of Filipino guest workers in Saudi Arabia that are basically slaves, only they're allowed some pittance. I yeah, think I think I think it does include uh, kind of like the economic slavery or what, yeah, yeah indentured servitude. It's whenever you're not getting paid. It's whenever you have no control, no power, all, everything, uh, all the power is taken out of your hands, and your only way to survive is to be a slave for this person. How does the clean water intersect with the slavery issue? Yeah, so that's been really great. We didn't even really see it coming, but uh, whenever we, you know, sit with the community, listen to their needs, brainstorm together, include them in on that process to where they really feel a part of the initiative, of the change in their own community. Like they had a say. It wasn't us coming in and saying, we have the answer, get out of the way, we're going to do this for you. It was, hey, let's come up with a solution together. We say Tamika Pamoja in Swahili, which basically means uh, let's work together on this. And so, um, the, the, both sides, the Makapala and the Pygmies, the non-Pygmies and the Pygmies, the slave masters and the slaves, were both suffering so much from not having clean water. Um, the Pygmies, uh, I mean, I, I've been to the three funerals uh, of the little guys that I've actually seen and held and everything else, um, Landy, Bo, Babo, and Siku. But, um, but yeah, I've been to about five or seven funerals total, which were of the slave master kids, uh, too. Or sorry, yeah, the, the people with the power that actually were making money. But the thing is, is they only make about a dollar, dollar twenty-five per day. And so there's these people that do have all the power because they're the slave master, but they're suffering immensely. They're incredibly impoverished. And so how do we come alongside them and say, if this is a... They, Actually, sitting down with one of the slave masters, who was also the chief in this one village that worked with us, he said, maybe for my grandfather, this arrangement was very beneficial to him. 
to my father too, but it started to take a real shift and turn of events to where now it's become, uh, you know, how do I feed my own family on a dollar, dollar twenty-five a day, and then how do I take care of these other people? Right. So it start, it seems like they they had slaves so that they could essentially get by on the pittance that they had. But if you solve the water issue, it sort of demilitarizes the arrangement where it's Absolutely. like, look, you know, you can support yourself. You'll have clean water. You'll survive. The condition is. You stop picking on these folks. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and it's all agreed upon to where the, they know how much they're suffering without clean water whenever their wives or their daughters who they can't send to school, even if they had the money to pay, they can't send their little girl to school because she needs to go collect water. Oh, that's And so walking 3.75 miles is the average walk for a woman in Africa to go collect water. Most times it's dirty. And so almost all times it's dirty. So you're walking, you know, uh, round trip, 3.75 miles. With a can of water. Minimum of one time a day, but normally two to three times a day. And this is a 20 liter jerry can or two 20 liter jerry cans, which whenever that five gallons is filled is 44 pounds. So these women and children are walking. Who are four foot five or whatever. Absolutely. Are walking this long walk. And even the, the Makpala, who are, you know, average-sized people, um, it, it, they're, they're walking this walk with them. And so being able to come in there and say, hey, we can end this walk. There's over, there's over a billion work days every year that are lost um, because of the water walks that women have to do. And so uh, the time that they spend doing that, it, when you come into a community and you're able to solve that problem, they are freed up in so many ways to focus their time and energy on things that are important. And so because they recognize that, that their suffering is going to end in, in so many ways, um, and they're going to be freed up to, to focus on what's important uh, instead of just going and making sure you can sur- survive that day by drinking this dirty water and hope that it doesn't give you typhoid or E. coli or cholera or some kind of intestinal parasite that can slowly kill you. Um, you know, it, it, it's a game changer. So when you buy the land, you've bought over 25,000 <clears throat> acres. For the pygmies to live on? No, 3,000. Okay, so I lo- the video was older, so I wondered yeah, if it's... Yeah, that was 2,470 acres. Okay. Yeah. Wow. And now it's 3,000. And what? so what's the real estate market like in the jungle in the Congo? <sighs> yeah, so it, it's it's varying, but if we wanted to buy it in our name, this is another reason we, we wanted to do it in the best way for the people, but then also the most logical way on the, the government kind of uh, level. It was going to be hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions uh, for us as a nonprofit to go buy land and hold those papers. Um, we were working with the local university and we wanted them to almost be the caretakers, but that was still going to be really expensive. But whenever we bought it in the name of a people, in the name of a tribe, that is the most respected uh, way to do it in Congress, the thing that stands up in court the most. That's the most powerful thing to do because they get to pass it down from generation to generation that way. So man, it brought down our acre cost to hundreds of dollars uh, per acre. So really, yeah, so you can buy dollars. whole farms for the less less than the price of a freaking jacket yeah. for a laptop computer. Yeah, absolutely. That's but, but, but if you do it for the people, it's not for you to come in there and do it for yourself. Right. They, you not going to put they, a McDonald's there. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, and you, with the, the long-standing relationships with the people, if they trust you, because it takes a while to build up the trust with the locals in the community, for them to see that there truly isn't. Um, you know, that it's truly for their best interest is what our heart is and that we're not coming in there, you know, even having well drilling equipment. I mean, these, you, you saw the equipment. It looks yeah. like you could be going for gold or diamond or gold. Damn. Yeah. Um, and so to prove to them that, Hey, we're not the, you know, people watching, are they, are they really looking for, for minerals or are they really helping us with water? It's like once they see that they're really getting the water, uh, that trust starts to build. I would imagine word starts to travel though. Like, no, they dug well for this guy. They dug a well over there. They dug a well over there. Yeah, and it's helped, it's helped spread, and our biggest advocates are Chief Leome and Chief Alondo, who were the first two pygmy chiefs to buy in, and now we get to take them to the other villages, or other villages come to them and ask whenever we're not around, you know, hey, did this really work? And they're like, hey, we were a part of the process from, from the beginning to the end of all the development. The community development, we were included in on that process. Do they have their own language, or do you speak Swahili? So they have their own language, it's so a local language, and then they have, they speak Swahili, but the national language is French, um, and they have, uh, well, they have five national languages. And so there's a, a funny quote that is, uh, that Tanzania, or sorry, Swahili was born in Tanzania, 
it got sick in Kenya, it died in Uganda, and it was buried in the Congo. <laughs> and so they can't even communicate with each other from Congo to Tanzania, really. Uh, it's just everything's lost in translation. What's the thing that you say in all... You, you show up in these videos, and I, you actually are a really good-natured guy, because I've seen you with, like, big black eyes in your videos, and I wouldn't be in such good humor if I got punched in the face... Right. 48 hours prior to my YouTube video. I'm not I, I'm not even in that great of a mood when I don't have tea in the morning. So I can imagine when you show up just beat up, you know, you have that higher sense of, of purpose. What is the the pygmy language that you're speaking in the beginning where you say hi to your peeps over there? Yeah, so that that's just a really broken Swahili. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm basically saying Chiniango, Efeosa, Mabutimangbo, Nafika Hapa Kuapenda. Uh, I'm a goo, I'm a goo. Basically what I'm saying is, hey, my name is, everyone there calls me Efeosa, my, my family in the tribe, which means the man who loves us. Mm. Um, but then Mabutimang Bo means uh, the big pygmy. And gotcha. so that's what everyone else <laughs> calls me. Um, and then I say, hey, I'm in here uh, because I love you. Whenever I'm, you know, after the fight, I say that. And then I'm a goo, I'm a goo basically means we are one. We are not different. Um, I love that saying, you know, we are one. We are not different. I'm a goo, I'm a goo. And uh, yeah, there's just so much beautiful stuff. Even their Swahili proverbs, you know, they say, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Or they say, if you think you're too small to make a difference, try to sleep in a closed room with a mosquito. And there's just so many things that are, that are so uh, encouraging about their culture. I've learned so much. I've grown so much. I've become a better person. Um, I've discovered a life that I can live that, that's bigger than me. That's uh, like I get to add value to my life, but to the lives of others. And whenever you do good for them, it actually comes back and, and makes you feel really good. And it's helped me stay straight, uh, you know, from my sobriety. And so, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of weird because you're doing it all hopefully with the heart and intention to truly help them. But at the same time, you're helping yourself. Um, and so it's 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 a beautiful circle whenever you do it in a way that's slow and steady and strategic. Uh, to, to, to not get too big for your britches, to not, uh, to not walk all over them and say, okay, we got this thing now. I know how to do it. Here's the blueprint. Here's the cookie cutter solution. And then think that that's going to work from this village to that village. You know, you got to go in there and spend the time, take the time to listen to them and learn. When you showed up in the jungle and you're like, I'm going to stay here for a year. How did you arrange that? I, I can't really imagine you and hey, I'm going to build one of these little huts over here and I'll see you guys every single day for the next 365 days. <laughs> yeah, well, it was it was similar to that. We found the team and we were like, hey, if we come in with this well drilling equipment, they already went to work on the land. Um, it looked like we were going to be able to secure that deal if we were actually bring, be able to bring in some, some development, some water and some food initiatives, uh, maybe even housing down the line. And yeah, so yeah, it, it, it came about just saying, hey, Let's. I'll, I'll. I'll go all in if this. If this is working, it started to develop in a way that. That we went. We went with like fifteen thousand dollars of well drilling equipment there, and uh, fifty thousand dollars of funds to hopefully drill uh, twelve water wells. We made the thirteen there. But yeah, there were a lot of challenges uh, along the way. Um, a lot of sickness. Yeah. Uh, did you get sick? Yeah, I did with uh, malaria three times. Um, yeah. I Yikes. wish it was only once or none, but. Uh, yeah, the first time I had malaria, it was brutal because, uh, yeah, I, I got so sick. I was vomiting red and green eventually, which was blood and bile. Oh, good. Um, yeah. I, I've never seen those things, so right. knock uh, on wood. It doesn't smell good either. Um, sorry for those listening. That's gross. <laughs> yeah, so that's gross. disgusting. But, uh, yeah, this little mosquito uh, almost knocked me out for good. I, um, I lost 33 pounds in five days. Jeez. I lost my peripheral vision completely. It was like tunnel vision. Uh, the rest was completely blurry. It sounded like I had a bee's hive in my ears constantly. My fever would spike up to over 103, and then it would plummet down to 96 something. Uh, um, and yeah, 65 to 70 percent of my bloodstream were parasites uh, from the malaria. Oh, that's disgusting. Yeah, and so uh, it was basically I was almost in a coma whenever I landed in Uganda. How did they even fix that? Uh, How luckily, did they get you? So they got you out of there somehow. Yeah, they got me out of there um, once. And they didn't, even when I left, they, the doctors, three or four different doctors were arguing. One doctor was saying he does have malaria, but all the other ones were saying, but it's not showing up on the test. Turns out the quick tests they were using uh, were expired and some different stuff. Oh, man. And uh, so, yeah, I, I went off to Uganda, found out there, and there was just a great doctor 
uh, actually named Dr. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that took care of Ironically. Me. Yeah, yeah, ironically. And uh, and it did make me happy that she was a great doctor and was able to take care of me. They, they see malaria there so much that they're specialists in treating it. So as long as you aren't in that coma, um, they're able to, to normally bring it back. So what do they do? They just give you a bunch of pills and an IV? Uh, uh, an IV uh, constantly around the clock. And they had doctors working on me for, I think it was at least three days giving me the IVs, but I think it was five days. Um, and it took me two or three weeks to be able to start eating kind of whole food again because uh, I was basically drinking juice the whole time uh, and eating smushed up bananas because my esophagus was raw from that oh. bile and everything else. Um, so it was brutal, man. I mean, I, I've, I've got a little scar here. I don't know if you can see that. Right oh, yeah, there. a little brown yeah. patch on your skin. Yeah, that was from a scorpion out there. Uh, it stung me. Gross. I was in the middle of the night, got up. Got out of the hut because yeah we 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 want to live exactly the way they, they live right. so that we have this heart connection of like hey we're we're on the same level we're looking eye to eye with you uh, we we understand um, or at least we're trying we're truly trying to understand and yeah this I uh, got up in the middle of the night it was just in the moonlight and uh, and kicked up some leaves so I was taking a leak and uh, the scorpion got me and but the chief got up and uh, and rallied the troops and they went and found the the kind of leaves and. I think roots, not the poison, but the kind they mashed up right. and were able to put on there and starting to suck out uh, or draw out the, the venom or the poison out of me. And man, I had broke out in a fever. My teeth were chattering. Oh, I was not man. in a good place. My joints were aching. Um, but they were able to put that on there and it actually started to, to pull that back out of me. It seems like it, it would be so uncomfortable to be in a situation like that for a year. Scorpions, fevers. How long does the, the malaria fever last? Man, it's different. The last two times, I think because, you know, I, I was lucky to survive the first one. The last two times have, have been, I wouldn't say mild, but but a whole lot better than that first one. Um, so the f first one was brutal. I didn't, I actually forgot to say, I, I didn't urinate for a full five days, and I had something called black water fever. Um, and so it's basically where your kidneys are failing, liver is oh, failing, man. and it looks like darker than black coffee. Uh, oh. Whenever you finally do get to urinate and get that release. Oh, um, man. And so... It was, it was brutal, but the last two times weren't so bad. Um, I've had intestinal bacteria and parasites and all this stuff, but, but I just have to, or, you know, in that moment, even the first time I got it, I was almost, uh, in a weird way, um, thankful for the opportunity to understand what they go through all the time. And so it just allowed me to have another set of compassion or empathy or understanding um, and, and be like, man, like, this is... This sucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. There's got to be a solution. There's got to be an answer. So now when you fight in Vegas in the shower, it takes too long to warm up. You're like, hey, no big deal. Yeah, it's all right <laughs> if the power's off or whatever. It's, it's pretty good. Well, thanks for doing what you're doing, and thanks for coming on the show today, man. Hey, thank you for having me, man. Love the podcast. So if people want to get involved with the charity and check that stuff out, check out your YouTube videos. We'll link to that in the show notes. But what if they want to dig a well in Congo? Yeah, I mean, we are absolutely uh, open to that, and that's at fightfortheforgotten.org. There's all the information right there. Um, man, a, a well, uh, the, the transformation to bring in not just the water well, but employ the people there, and then also do the wash program, that's around $4,200. But um, but uh, to make it a bite size amount, $25 a month, that changes the lives of 15 people throughout the course of a year. Well, they'll have clean water for the rest of their lives. That's we get crazy. To, yeah, we get to empower the... Locals, not just to drill it, but also be able to repair it if anything happens. Thank you so much. And thank you. That was a super interesting show. The stories are incredible. The fact that he just went to the jungle for a year and decided, I'm going to live in a little hut and make these people my family is really funny. And if you want to look up Justin's videos on YouTube, they're worth it. The kids and the pygmy people are just really cute and endearing, and he's so much bigger than them. He's literally twice the size of a lot of these people. Great big thank you to Justin for coming by today and doing that. He's got a book. We'll link that in the show notes, and most importantly, we'll link to a lot of these videos that we talked about during the show in the show notes as well, including the fight that he had, his comeback, one of his comeback fights here with an awesome speech at the end. And it's a short one. He made short work of his opponent in that one. If you enjoyed this one, don't forget to thank Justin on Twitter. We'll have that linked in the show notes as well. I'd love it if you tweet at me your number one takeaway from Justin Wren. I'm at The Art of Charm on Twitter. And remember, if you want those show notes, you can tap our album art in most mobile podcast players to see the show notes for this episode. And we'll link to the show notes right on your phone. 
If you're interested in our live programs, our AOC boot camps, that's at theartofcharm.com slash boot camp. Join thousands of other guys who've been through the program who'll become your network for life. All around the world, we've had people backpacking through Europe, working at Art of Charm, meeting up when traveling, couch surfing, even gotten jobs and formed lifelong friendships. And frankly, the growth that people experience during and mostly after the boot camp is astounding and amazing. And it's just one of the best parts of running the show and the company here. That's theartofcharm.com slash bootcamp. And also, if you want to dip your toes in the water, join the AOC challenge at theartofcharm.com slash challenge. Or you can text the word charmed, C-H-A-R-M-E-D, to 33444. The challenge is about improving your networking and connection skills and inspiring those around you to develop a personal and professional relationship with you. And of course, we'll send you the fundamentals toolbox that I mentioned earlier on the show, which includes great practical stuff ready to apply right out of the box on reading body language, having great nonverbal communication, the science of attraction, negotiation techniques, networking and influence strategies, persuasion and mentorship, and everything else that we teach here at The Art of Charm. It'll make you a better networker, a better connector, and of course, a better thinker. That's theartofcharm.com slash challenge, or text CHARMED, C-H-A-R-M-E-D, to 33444 here in the States. For full show notes for this and all previous episodes, head on over to theartofcharm.com slash podcast. This episode of AOC was produced by Jason DeFilippo. Jason Sanderson is our audio engineer and editor, and the show notes on the website are by Robert Fogarty. Theme music by Little People, transcriptions by transcriptionoutsourcing.net. I'm your host, Jordan Harbinger. Go ahead, tell your friends, because the greatest compliment you can give us is a referral to someone else, either in person or shared on the web. Word of mouth really is everything. So, share the show with friends and enemies, stay charming, and as they say in Swahili, Acha kila kitu musuri goliko oyokuta. In other words, leave everything and everyone better than you found them. <laughs>